Today we are setting up a part of an experiment where we're studying management of beech leaf disease, an emerging threat to the American beech forest on a larger scale. So beech leaf disease causes symptoms where if you look through to the light, you'll see these distinctive banding patterns uh, between the leaf veins. And then over time, the disease will cause distorted, malformed leaves that are almost leathery in texture. And eventually, uh, buds will fail to leaf out. They'll abort, and then the canopies will start to thin. We have some very effective tools now to manage BLD on specimen trees, landscape trees, trees in arboreta, parks, but that is entirely different than managing a, a problem on this scale in a forest like this. In a forest setting, it's very difficult to treat every single tree on a scale that's grand like acres and acres of forest. Can we slow this disease down by doing some integrative management approaches? So this study site presents an incredible opportunity for us to take a, a model from silviculture and see if we will be able to develop a program that we can apply to other forests in the region, land conservancies, uh, or even homeowners who might have you know, one to 10 acres of beech forest that they want to preserve in some way. One of the things that we borrow from traditional forestry practices called crown release. And so in crown release, you're separating the crowns of trees and you're opening up more light exposure so that tree can then form more photosynthetic machinery, which are leaves, um, and grow at a faster clip. So when the nematodes infect the leaves, um, as I said in the later stages, buds abort. So the, the, the tree put energy cost into forming those buds, thinking that it's gonna form leaves that will photosynthesize, and now they don't. The trees sometimes throw out a secondary flush of leaves, which probably not photosynthesizing as well as a uh, normal flush of leaves. And so that comes at a cost as well. So the trees are having to tap into carbon stores that are stored in the wood um, to form the next flush of leaves. And so over time, this decline happens. And if you think about it like a bank account, it's just robbing the savings account over and over and over. So resiliency in this disease is a factor of carbon storage. With the silvicultural approach of doing this crown release process, we think that we can make the trees grow at a faster rate and form a higher volume of wood, which can store more carbon. So while the disease can still come in and impact these trees, the trees will be able to deal with it a little bit better. In addition to the crown release, we're doing selective removals of understory and midstory. We've seen this disease progress in a forest from the understory following to the midstory, following to the overstory. This site is a beach dominant forest. The denser the beach, the more inoculum potential there is. And all of these trees have now become, as my colleague says, just nematode factories that produce billions of these nematodes. So if we remove some of these trees, we can remove physically the inoculum source for this disease. And so by do making the trees more resilient, and by removing inoculum sources at some capacity, we can do two-fold things with just this selective removal and crown release process. Uh, we have an additional treatment where we are using our root flare injection. We're selecting trees that are eight inches and larger, and we're evenly distributing them through a quarter acre plot by skipping every other tree. Can we get some level of slowing down disease progress by treating every other one because we are basically eliminating or removing inoculum sources for the neighboring trees. So by treating a small percentage, can we have a bigger effect on the greater good of that forest area? And then our third treatment is a combination of the two where we're doing some selective removal and crown release in addition to the root flare injections and then finally, we have to have a baseline control of you know, what happens if we do nothing. Um, so we have non-treated control plots. We're thrilled to be part of this research. This is the first venture into forest level management of beech leaf disease.
There's just so many beach out here, like how can we address it? And I hope in the five year time span of this research, we have more answers. I think in the five year period, we'll at least be able to see trends of what can happen uh, to predict for the long term. Because this project is not necessarily trying to focus on something that's gonna be an immediate fix for the forest uh, right away. Um, it's something to predict, you know, the next 20 to 100 years of what this forest could be. It all starts with diversity. Diverse forest stands are gonna help slow this disease down. So if we allow the next generation to be species other than beach, while still retaining some of the beach canopy, we suspect that we can make a much more resilient forest related to this disease. So we will not just be looking at the growth of the beech trees, but also those other species in these plots to see how they respond to the changing forest dynamics. So our goal here is not complete eradication. It's about managing the disease at a level at which the trees can again function as they need to function. We first saw beech leaf disease in the forest four years ago or so in, in 2021. And when we were able to connect with Bartlett, we had a partner who really had a lot of expertise. They offered resources. It feels like we have a partner in the work to do the research and learn about the forest on how we can combat beech leaf disease really across the region. If we find that our treatments are effective in slowing down this disease, this becomes a plug and play sort of management strategy for landowners, government agencies, National Park Service, for trying to preserve uh, the American beach canopy as well as just preserving the forest at large. 